once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Susan Tassoni, author of Prayers, Promises, and Devotions for the Holy Souls in Purgatory, of course, and it's published by our Sunday Visitor. <laughs> if you're here, it's got to be about purgatory. I think it is. That's right, and the Holy Souls. Prayers, Promises, and Devotions for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. Now, how many books is this on this topic? Uh, this is number seven. Number seven. Number seven, yes. And, and how do you keep finding more to write on this topic? I, you know, uh, Doug, I, my editor, we talk about this, and it's clearly providence. It's inspiration from God. There's no plan. There's nothing that we're looking at down the line. After a work comes out, I think it's basically through prayer, adoration, and um, the idea surfaces in my mind, or I call, we call, we talk mm -hmm. about it. And if it uh, seems like it's something that hasn't been done before or has been, maybe needs to be brought back and renewed, um, they go to a executive meeting and there it is. Mm -hmm. But she really attributes it to a providence. God's providence mm -hmm. is leading. You, this. you think there's a need for this and that's why this is happening? Now? Oh yes, it, not only a need, um, uh, there's a demand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a great love for uh, our dead and people will go out of their way to do whatever they can to help them or to keep them part of their life Right. And, and do whatever to extend whatever grace they need if they're in purgatory. Well, we've talked about the multiple books that you've done over the years going back. I guess the first time you hear was Praying in the Presence of Our Lord for the Holy Souls. That was the in, first, yes. Back in 02, 30-day yes. devotion, prayers for the eternal life, praying with the saints for the Holy Souls in purgatory. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's interesting because in the back of the book, you note that the Way of the Cross for the Holy Souls in purgatory has sold over 80,000 copies. So it, it justifies what you're saying about mm -hmm. popularity. Mm -hmm. Now, one would say maybe from a publishing side, well, it's a hot topic, so let's do more books. Mm -hmm. But let me ask you the question, because if when people die these days, everybody goes to heaven, uh, certainly it sounds like that at the funeral masses for mm -hmm. most cases, mm -hmm. why is there such an interest in people paying, praying for people who they don't believe are still in purgatory? Do people really still believe people go to purgatory? There, you know, I think that's also a comeback. Um, I think um, what I'm seeing is more of the meat and potatoes are now being, um, you know, presented to the people. The truth is coming out more. Our John Paul II. Teaching inside the church itself. Yes, the, cate the catechism. catechism. E.W. Chan is his prime example. Um, you know, people are relearning their faith and um, they're open to it. Uh, and so I happen to be in a spot where it, it you know, it, mm -hmm. it's a part of my life and, and pr presenting to it, Doug, the response is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So e that's another clue is they respond with, with uh, great concern and whatever they need to do to help. So um, it's their reaction mm -hmm. that we're responding to. Well, one of the things you mentioned the catechism, and I know on page 45, there's a nine day novena of meditations from the catechism of the Catholic Church on the mystery of purgatory. Uh, you know, it's interesting, again, because in many times in people's minds, they think of purgatory as being sort of passe mm -hmm. and the teaching on it. But uh, here it is directly related to the catechism. Why did you decide to include something like that? I did this because, um, you know, the, the catechism is, is, you know, is a, is a thick book. And I was reading the catechism one night. It was about three in the morning. And I got up and I was reading the doctrine. I refer to it quite often, you know, mm -hmm. regarding the doctrine of purgatory. And I realized this is so beautiful. And the words are so rich and deep that I wanted to be able to do something for the reader that they would be able to take it in a way where they can not just read it, but they could reflect on it. They could meditate on it. They could go deep and then bear fruit. Mm -hmm. And so it, it actually ended up into a nine day novena. And a novena, of course, is, you know, nine mm -hmm. days of prayer. And I also, just doing this myself nine days, Doug, I discovered something that I didn't realize, and I've read this many times, day three. Um, our prayers for them is capable not only of helping them, but also of making their intercession for us effective. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that, that the more we pray for their release, the more effective their intercession is for you. 
And that's very powerful. I guess I didn't realize until uh, reading this book uh, or didn't focus on the idea that certainly I, I think of the idea and you've always encouraged mm. uh, and you, you encourage in this book praying for the holy souls. And one of the things I picked up from you in, in our family prayer is praying for those, especially in my family who've died, who have no one to pray for them. The forgotten, the abandoned souls. Right. Uh, I, that's a real popular question. Uh, who are they? You know, first of all, I get the question, who are the holy souls? Mm. Uh, you know, is it some third party that we can't really get our arms around and they're just a group that we pray for? No, the holy souls are mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, nieces, doctors, pharmacists, lawyers that have been entwined in the fabric of our lives. The abandoned souls um, are, I consider two groups, mm -hmm. Doug. Those are the people that don't believe in the doctrine of purgatory, or their families really are not praying for them, or you know, we have this great opportunity to have masses, offer our indulgences, our rosaries, our stations, and they're not getting those kinds of prayers. So those people that don't believe in the doctrine of purgatory, and as you mentioned, even people in our own faith that think that purgatory is no longer part of, uh, you know, part of our doctrine, part of our, part of our faith, and, and it truly is. Um, the second group, uh, I thought about it, talked to, to people about it, priests, religious, it, it's that. Mm -hmm. The second group of abandoned souls are the consecrated priests and religious. Why? Because we tend to canonize them. Mm -hmm. Not only do we canonize them, we canonize our relatives and our friends, and then we leave off too soon our prayers for them, and they suffer. Now, Doug, what if they already went to heaven, and we continue uh, to pray for them? What happens to those prayers? Uh, there is something that Thomas Aquinas calls accidental glory. If a soul is already in heaven, and we continue to pray for them, that soul gets two things. It gets an increase in its intercessory power again, which we which we talked about on day three. Mm -hmm. It also gets an increase in its intimacy with God. So the lesson is never stop praying for your dead. Well, that, that and that's what I wanted to follow up on, the intercessory part, because I think about us interceding for the holy souls. Mm -hmm. But the idea from your book, uh, and I guess it's always been there, but I, I didn't pick up on it as well, is that they can intercede for us. It seems kind of like we're praying for them, they're praying for us. Uh, can they pray for themselves? Yes, great question. Um, once the soul leaves the body, the eyes of the soul cannot close without being in utter agony because they saw the face of God mm -hmm. and they're unable to unite, um, to, to unite with him in heaven. But what they can do in purgatory is, well, and also when they're in purgatory, the time of merit, once the soul leaves the body, the time of merit ends. Mm -hmm. That's it. Whatever you're bringing with you, you know, merits, graces, stops. Okay. So you're either going to be in heaven or you're going to be paying a debt or hopefully not in, um, you know, not in hell. So they cannot pray for themselves. However, and again, back to the catechism, mm -hmm. they're capable of interceding for us. And when I wrote this book, Doug, I learned more than I thought I, I thought I really covered in praying with the saints for the holy souls. I thought I covered it, but again, more reading, more research, I was fascinated that not only do they intercede for us, Doug, they do more than that. They're, they're anxious for us mm -hmm. to help them out of purgatory, but they are committed to our salvation. Mm -hmm. And they're committed to making sure that we understand and are aware of our faults and to correct those faults because they don't want us to go to purgatory. And because they have an understanding of the reality that yes, we really don't. Yes, they, they know what it's like and they know the tremendous pain that they suffer being without God. So their goal is, yes, to get out of purgatory, but their primary concern mm -hmm. is our salvation and to make sure that we understand our faults and to correct them, that we understand the malice of sin, that we understand that they want us to go directly to heaven and that we should really put ourselves under the influence of the souls. Mm -hmm. Their influence can help us avoid purgatory. Now the preface is put together by a particular cardinal, is it, uh, and how do you pronounce his name? Diaz, Cardinal D Diaz. Cardinal Diaz. Now. He uh, talks about this book as the latest contribution of Susan Sony to Devotions to the Holy Souls in Purgatory. It comes at a time when a new generation or generations of young Catholics hunger to be catechized in this ancient devotion that is often overlooked both in preaching and in parochial teaching, especially among children and young adults, but also among many others. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were really talking about before. Right. There, um, there's a hunger, and, and I've been invited more and more to speak to grammar school, all the way up to college uh, students, and uh, they 
received a lot of fluff, and they don't want fluff. They want the meat and potatoes. They want the truth. And I was utterly surprised to talk to first graders, Doug, that knew more about purgatory than um, any many of the adults that, that I speak to. Mm -hmm. uh, they're catechized very well. They have a true understanding what purgatory is, which is the loss of the sight of God. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the primary pain, the primary uh, loss of a soul. Now you say, and he, he mentions in this book, that this takes a new and creative approach to devotions beginning with novenas, with reflections and prayers that are easily accessible for anyone. How is it new and creative? It, what, what was, I, I think he was referring to, um, well one of the things he was referring to was the catechism, that we put it into a novena. Mm -hmm. We took the um, uh, John Paul's writings, his catechesis on purgatory that he gave in August of 1999, and we took all of his writings and put that into a nine-day novena. Just another way, again, to, to, to meditate, to reflect, and to go deep and to bear fruit praying these prayers. He notes that uh, you provide in this a special contribution in the prayers for eternal life, which are prayers that family and friends can use when staying by the sides of a loved one who is dying. I thought that was really important, especially for many of the people who watch EWTN who have loved ones maybe in nursing homes or at home, maybe in hospice care at some level, and uh, are suffering. This was uh, an incredible inspiration from God. I, I, our Sunday visitor, we were just thrilled that this idea surfaced that, you know, what's the grace of a happy death, Doug? You know, how do you prepare for eternal life? The grace of a happy death, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not to die in the state of Alabama or the state mm -hmm. of Illinois. It's to die in the state of grace. Mm -hmm. And we have to petition God for that grace. Over 150,000 people die every year. Our, you know, we prepare for weddings, we prepare for school, we prepare for uh, school, but do we prepare for eternal life? Mm -hmm. And what we put together is, what's the best way to prepare for eternal life? And, and actually, it's quite simple. The best way to prepare is forgiveness, is um, it, the sacrament of reconciliation, it's exercising patience in adversity, it's humility, it's having a great devotion to our Lord and Our Lady. All those things bring and that's, grace that's upon us. That's chapter nine too. Yes, right, the, right. The, the, the last Pious chapter. Pious practices to prepare for eternal life. Right. right, also another best way, there's a great organization, Doug, and you're familiar with the Pious Union of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. Their organization is to actually um, encourage people to pray for the dying. That prayer is in the book. To become a member is to be able to pray this prayer every day. And what it does is, let's say someone is dying and they're on the road to perdition. By you praying this prayer, this prayer can give them whatever grace they need. It could give them an act of contrition mm -hmm. or communion, whatever that they need. And you can kick them off, off that road of perdition and kick them into purgatory and become a mother or father to that soul and help them reach heaven. So we're very excited that we have, uh, also what's in here, were many of the prayers that the saints composed. Right. They composed these prayers for their own strength mm -hmm. and their own grace. And I, I wanted to bring these prayers back that they wrote, the prayers that the church gave us. I didn't want them to be forgotten. These are mm -hmm. real treasury of prayers that we need to begin to pray again. They really haven't been popularly out there, basically. Right, in the last right. Few and years. I didn't want them to be lost. Okay. Neither did our Sunday visitors. So we have these prayers. There's litanies. You know, there are six official litanies in the church. And these, what are litanies? They're intense forms of prayer mm -hmm. that um, that invoke Our Lady or our Guardian Angel or Saint Joseph for uh, you know for a happy death or for fair weather or for protection. Those are those are in this uh, section as well. Well, I noticed the one Saint Faustina's supplication for a happy death. Oh, if only the suffering soul knew how it is loved by God, it would die of joy and excess of happiness. Someday we will know the value of suffering. We always hear that you, from Mother yes, Angelica. Yes, but yes. then we will no longer be able to suffer. The present moment is ours. The, that's another, uh, I have something. Another uh, Mother Angelica. Another mother, in fact, I quoted moment. her. She, I do a whole meditation mm -hmm. about her. You know, the main thing is doing God's will in all things. That's the, that's the way to avoid purgatory. The number one way, and I learned that from Mother, is to do God's will in all things. And Faustina, I would add, this was very fascinating from her diary. If the angels were capable of envy, they would envy us for two things, one in receiving communion and the other is suffering. Right, you say in the section uh, we were just talking about the pious practices to prepare for eternal life. 
when someone is dying or terminally ill, persons who are dying or terminally ill may offer their sufferings for those or other intentions, and you have some of these listed, world peace, sanctification of the clergy, holy mm -hmm. souls, and purgatory. And then on the, on the page opposite, on 183, you talk about for, for these practices when death is near. This one struck me. Even though the dying person appears unconscious, whisper the sweet name of Jesus in his or her ear, repeat an act of contrition, continue praying. The sense of hearing is the last sense to leave a dying person. I didn't know that. that yes, I, I think I learned that here on EWGN. Mm -hmm. um, and that it, it's true. And um, they, need, they need consolation. Mm -hmm. They need strength. And that's the last sense to leave. And so my parents have died. And that's what we did at the hour of their death. And, and we do find, I guess, medical science has proven more and more that when people come out of comas or other situations, that they're much more aware of what's going around, on around them than we thought many times before. Exactly. Um, the, the senses are, you know, especially the hearing, mm -hmm. are, the, are the last to go. Now, well, let me ask you, this one I had never heard of it near the end of the book, the apostolic pardon. Oh, yes, yes. What is an apostolic oh, this, pardon? This was a treasure. I, I you know, I, when I write, I, 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 I do a lot of reading. And I, again, when I was focusing on the dying, that came up. You know, the, uh, there's uh, this. I, I actually saw it in the Book of Indulgences, mm -hmm. and it's uh, when uh, someone is dying, the priest imparts um, the anointing, uh, the sacrament of reconciliation, and Holy Viaticum, the Last Communion. But there's also an apostolic pardon, which basically is an indulgence that remits all temporal punishment. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you can you go straight to heaven. It's it's the divine mercy indulgence that we get on Divine Mercy Sunday. All temporal punishment is re removed, and it seemed like it was. It's been understated. Uh, the priest has a has a uh, an option to impart it, and um, I I, mm -hmm. I thought this is. I spoke with Monsignor Galis, who actually wrote this for me, and and really encourages. Um, priests when they're, uh, you know, if there is someone dying, to impart this. They have the option, I think, they have to determine if, this, if the person is, is dying, and, and then, then they can impart it. But it's, it's so powerful, and it's another... And the person has to want it, right? Isn't that also... Not, ne not necessarily. If oh, the person okay. is dying, that priest can impart it. Okay, because um, I read something that said the one condition necessary in such a situation then is that the dying person should have desired this indulgence and prayed for it. Okay, you know what I'm thinking? I think that if they didn't even know existed, mm -hmm. that the priest would impart, impart it and give, give them this particular grace. But again, it points to the riches and the graces um, that we have in our faith and to take advantage of these. Mm -hmm. Now in the beginning, uh, note the importance of this. That Blessed John the 23rd wrote, the devotion to the memory of the dead is one of the most beautiful expressions of the Catholic spirit and also Pope Benedict XVI's admonition that the importance of prayers for the dead, especially the offering of the Mass for them, so that once purified, they can be, come to the beatific vision of God. There we again point to the chief devotion of the Holy Souls in Purgatory. The chief devotion is the Mass. Um, masses for the dead, either attend a Mass, have them offered. Gregorian Masses, mm -hmm. as you know, is my favorite the subject, right. 30 masses in a row for one deceased soul, put those in your will. And then also, in the, the last book we talked about, having masses offered while you're alive, mm -hmm. because that also gives you grace and merit to help you become holy and still sanctify you know, yourself throughout life. After death, you're not able to do that, but a mass while you're, you're still alive can also aid you in that. Right, now so you, you mentioned Saint Gregory and you talk about his involvement. And there's a couple of personalities here, mm -hmm. Justice yes. and uh, Copiosis. Copiosis. Uh, Copiosis. Uh, what's the story there? This was, uh, this was fascinating. And, and I have to, if you don't mind me just sharing this, I was trying to, I learned about Gregorian Masses again, 30 Masses in a row for one to see soul. Um, and it was popularized by Pope St. Gregory. Uh, Justice was a monk in his monastery. Justice was also a physician. Mm -hmm. And he took care of uh, Pope St. Gregory. He, uh, Pope St. Gregory was, a, was, a, was weak physically because of the austerities of his sacrifices and his penances. And um, Justice was, was sick and it was his last illness. He was dying. And um, uh, St. Gregory called on Justice's blood brother, Copiosis, to, to assist him. And Copiosis found in Justice's cell three gold coins, which was, uh, he took the vow of poverty. So it was against the, the vow that he took. And he shared that with Pope St. Gregory. 
St. Gregory was really distraught by that, and he said to, um, to all the brothers, you're not allowed to visit him or console him. Copiosis will take care of that. And then the justice realized where were his brothers, and Copiosis told him what happened, and of course he repented. And after he died, Gregory realized he didn't have enough time to do penance, so he had 30 masses offered for his soul. On the 30th mass, justice appeared to his brother Copiosis and said he was released from purgatory. Copiosis was so excited he went to the monastery, shared this with the monks. The monks looked up the, when the masses were offered and it was on the 30th day. The $64,000 question is, is, well, are you released from purgatory after 30 masses are offered? The church doesn't officially say that 30 masses releases a soul. The church, again, points to the efficacy of the masses. Mm -hmm. So. Gregory popularized the 30 masses, okay. but why 30? Why not 50 or 60? He, 30 actually goes back to the Old Testament. Moses, Aaron, and Jacob were mourned for 30 days. Well, he was bringing back that tradition. Okay. So this happened in the monastery in Rome, and, and it took me years to try to get into the monastery. We're talking 10 years, mm -hmm. and last year we finally got in, and we actually have a picture of the altar where the first set of Gregorian Masses were first offered. And what was so special too was there's um, reliefs in the altar explaining uh, what happened at this altar. And it's on where, page 23, Yes, right? where mm -hmm. Pope's, it says, you know, this is where justice was released from purgatory he, after the 30 Masses. The center talks about Pope St. Gregory offering Masses, not only, he, he loved the souls, so he would offer Masses for souls in purgatory at this altar, and then finding our Lord had appeared to him uh, while he was offering mass and that relief is there. So it was a great honor to be able to find this altar and share it with the world. And you credit, I think you mentioned in the beginning, you've given credit to the photographer. It, yes. Who actually it, got in, it, got it, the picture for yes, you, right? Yes, Tim Ravelli was, is a lawyer, a good mm -hmm. lawyer friend of mine, and he was on his way to, uh, uh, to Rome. One of the bishops was becoming cardinal, and I said, he said, do you want me to do anything? I said, Tim, for years I have, I, one sentence I found for 13 years, this one sentence talked about this altar. And he says, I'll find it. Mm -hmm. And he actually had an Italian driver. Mm -hmm. It took an Italian driver to knock on this door, <laughs> you know how they are, right. and let him in. Right. And Tim was able to go in and capture the picture. And, and it's just, it, it's rare. It's rare mm -hmm. to get into the church, I understand, and it's rare to be able to share this picture. So now we actually see the actual altar where these started. In fact, once those masses were offered for justice, uh, Doug, word spread all mm -hmm. over Rome. People were coming to the monastery wanting to have these masses offered. Priests were coming overseas wanting to offer masses for their loved ones at this mm -hmm. altar. So other altars were designated to have these Gregorian masses offered. Now remember, there are 30 in a row for one to see soul. It points to the efficacy mm -hmm. of the masses and it's important to put them in your will. Oh, that's interesting. Now you say the holy souls are listening for us. That I understand, are we listening to them? Yes. What can we hear from them? What, what they, you know, they, they say, preach to them. You know, they're saying, you know, tell them that time, you know, flees and that tomorrow, you know, is, may not be there for you. And that to, you know, to live the sacramental life, to do good works, um, to pray, uh, to, the, the sacramental life is what they're pointing to, to become holy on, on, on earth and not have to go through the workshop of purgatory. Uh, we're n are we listening to them? Meaning, are we offering our prayers, our sacrifices, our masses? Mm -hmm. I call them the four pillars, the mass, the rosary, uh, the stations, Eucharistic adoration are the most powerful ways to help the souls. Why? Because of the indulgences attached to them. So that's the question. Are we hearing them? Are we hearing their plea? We may hear, we may, you know, do a lot of reminiscing, mm -hmm. but you know, and, and feel sad, but are we responding? And as I said before, what if a soul's already in heaven? There's never any prayers that are wasted. wasted right. Well, let me ask you, you don't waste any time and you've put out a number of books on the Holy Souls. Is there another one out there? I, Is now, there more I, to be said? I never, I never, never imagined this would happen. But yes, we're, we're looking at, you know, and I keep thinking this mm -hmm. is the last work. I think this is it. Thir 30 Day Devotions, that book, 30 Day Devotions for the Holy Souls, has been the most prayed. Mm -hmm. And so we thought we would do 365 days with the souls in purgatory because they suffered 
365 mm -hmm. days a year, 24 hours a day, there's no relief, and we're their only deliverers. Heaven encourages them, and we deliver them with our merits, with our sacrifices, with our masses. Just before we go, you were uh, on Father Mitch's show back in the fall. Yes. And uh, Father Mitch has that book on the year of the faith. Yes. How to do a year of faith. Yes. And we're in the year of faith. How does this relate to the year of faith, or does it, this it book? It does, because we're to take action. You know, we are to take something, you know, you know, uh, uh, Pope Benedict said, read the catechism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a treasure. It's a great tool of our faith. And that's something you can take out, you know, and do something for the souls during the year of faith. You know, they want to join us mm -hmm. um, during this year. They want to get out. And that's, I think it's a great apostolate. Right. I think it's a great way that we can do something um, without having to fly all over the world. And it's a good way for us to keep in mind that uh, this is the temple world and there is our home someplace. This is, else, just right? as Father Mark said at Mass this morning, it's a, we're on a pilgrimage, right. and this is temporary. Okay, sounds like a, a good way to end things. Thank you so much for all it your work for the Holy, pleasure. holy Souls and keeping them in front of us and in our mind and in our prayers. Thank you so much. We'll look for the next book. Speaking here with Susan Tassoni, author of Prayers, Promises, and Devotions for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. Check it out, published by our Sunday Visitor, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, as are all of her books. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark.